Hey guys, Ron here. Uh, I'm still out of breath because I just did my run. Now, why is this guy uh, doing a video after he's just run? He's out of breath. Because I'm unique, I think, outside the box. Unlike the professor of mine in college I'm about to tell you about. But anyway, the subject today, I had a burning desire. I've been thinking about this. I'm going to show you this beautiful neighborhood. I'm going to show you some of the ocean. Obviously, I can't be in any locations that relate to the subject that I'm about to talk about. So... We'll just look at some interesting stuff and I'll talk. Okay. Look at this beautiful beachside neighborhood. Absolutely lovely. The weekends in the summer, very difficult to get a parking spot up here, but during the week, it's fine. Usually, even during the summer, which is not quite yet. Anyway, so today I wanna to talk about Jack Ruby. I believe Jack Ruby was the key to the entire Kennedy assassination, and I'll tell you why. First of all, let's talk a little bit about Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby was born Jack Rubenstein, and Jack was from Chicago. And, oh boy, you know, I don't know that for a fact, uh, but I believe he was from Chicago. And... He was affiliated, associated with Midwest mobsters, particularly the, the Italian mob. And since Jack was Jewish, he could never rise up the ranks of the Italian mob. He could just be basically what's known as an earner for them. And they would always associate with an earner because if someone's making that money, you know, generally speaking, they would deal with them unless the guy had loose lips and would sink ships. So, uh, Jack Ruby was, like I said, associated with the Midwest mob. And I believe it was 1947 when the decision was made to move some associates, including Jack Ruby, out to the West Coast in various places. And Jack landed in Dallas, Texas. And, uh, you know, the idea was to be closer to, to expansion, really, is what it was. Now, this also happened all across the board, particularly with the Midwest mob. If you have seen the movie, one of my all-time favorite movies, Casino, which is, there's a book, Casino, too. It was actually written at the same time as the, the screenplay was being written. But the book, Casino, with Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci uh, and Sharon Stone. Casino was the true life story of how the mob bought and ran and created basically, well, not created, but because it was created in the 40s, essentially by Bugsy Siegel, but how the mob ran, there's an airplane taking off from LAX, how the mob ran Las Vegas from the 40s till the 80s, early 80s, till all the, everything hit the fan. But, anyway, my point in all this is to say that Let's say, for instance, the let's take the subject of that movie. In the movie, Casino, the hotel was called the Tangiers. And it was run by a businessman, a real estate owner. And uh, secretly, of course, it was run and controlled by the Midwest mob and operated by Robert De Niro in that film, who was a, played a character called Ace Rothstein. Now, the real Tangiers was the Stardust Hotel in Las Vegas. And it was it was owned, it was bought, purchased with a Teamster loan, which was funded by, the, you know, which was mob approved. It was run by a guy named Alan Glick, who the mob affectionately called Glasses and Professor and all kinds of crazy things uh, while during Glick's tenure there. But in reality, Glick was told in no uncertain terms by uh, Lefty Rosenthal himself, who denied it to his dying day, but he did, by Rosenthal himself, again, who, you know, portrayed the character, uh, who was portrayed by Robert De Niro in the movie, by Rosenthal himself and by the Chicago mob. In a room, Glick was flown out in the early 70s to Milwaukee, not Chicago mob, excuse me, to Milwaukee, and put in a hotel room or office and almost dangled out the window with one light shining in his eye and the mob boss telling him you do what I say or you 
and your kids and your wife are going to be tortured and killed. And from that point on, Glick had to leave the casino in fear of his life and his family's life. But my point is that's how things operated. So while it is reported that Jack Ruby, his claim to fame, most most famous claim to fame, was that he owned or controlled a strip club in Dallas called the Carousel Club. It is, from my research, has shown that the true owner and controller of the Carousel Club and <laughs> numerous other ventures, including owning politicians and police unions and so forth in Louisiana and Texas, the main points of his control was the mob boss, Carlos Marcello. You may say Carlos Marcello. Marcello was, I believe, the most dangerous mob boss probably ever the scariest and he was even more anti Jack Kennedy and I'll talk about that a little bit later and certainly Bobby Kennedy actually not as much Jack Kennedy but Bobby Kennedy the Attorney General and then his other contemporaries including Sam Giancana the Chicago mob boss and uh, Santos Traficante and the Florida mob boss with the exception of maybe Jimmy Hoffa those four guys, though, in my opinion, after decades of research, are the ones who engineered and carried out the Kennedy assassination, um, controlled and carried out by the mob. Um, but I'll go into that theory uh, on another video. But Jack Ruby was meant to be a key player in all that. And why? Well, because... Like I said, so you can do your research on Carlos Marcello. Carlos Marcello, look at this beautiful area. Don't look at me, it's boring. Carlos Marcello was an immigrant who, you know, eventually worked his way up. You know, I'm sorry, it's been a long time. I don't remember whether Marcello was born here or in Sicily. I think he was born in Sicily. Actually, yes, of course he was an immigrant because uh, Bobby Kennedy once threw him out of the country, which was the impotence for Marcelo going crazy on the Kennedys. Uh, literally had him, what they called illegally deported, to, I believe, Honduras, where he almost died in the jungle and had to bribe and fight and scrape his way back to the United States. And then Marcelo's one obsession was killing Bobby Kennedy, who had done this to him. But we'll get to that uh, later or another time. Anyway, Marcelo... Carlos Marcelo owned and controlled Texas and Louisiana. Now, there was a mob boss of Texas, Javela, but really he took his orders, the main orders, from Carlos Marcelo. Marcelo, Traficante of Florida, Sam Giancana of uh, Chicago. By the way, Giancana and Traficante both ended up dead in the mid-70s murdered both of them when they were about to testify in the House uh, investigations, the, you know, the House assassinations uh, in the mid-70s led by uh, G. Robert Blakey, who uh, the Harvard professor who also believes the mob uh, killed Kennedy. Uh, but Marcelo was so tough that he didn't get axed. Either they were too scared of going after him or the other mobsters or they knew he would get out of testifying but I'm sure you know I, I, I imagine that had Giancana been allowed been able to testify or compelled to testify or Trump County I'm sure they just would have taken the fifth amendment and everything but can't take a chance so they were both murdered uh, Giancana was murdered in his own home with a bunch of bullets shot around his mouth by the way which is a mob uh, uh, like this you know, like sleeps with fishes you know a mob sign that means don't talk it's a sign to other people that other other individuals if you talk or if we think you're going to talk this is what's going to happen to you anyway so if we believe the premise which i do that marcella owned and controlled texas and louisiana in the 50s and 60s and even later i mean marcelo is the only one who died a natural death 
in prison, well, after he was released from prison and then left, and he was allowed to die at home uh, and with Alzheimer's dementia, which coincidentally he claimed, just like Ruby, Ruby's cancer in his last year or two, that Marcelo claimed that in prison they had sort of messed with his health and given him these ailments. But anyway, uh, if you believe the premise as I do, that Jack Ruby was really a pawn, that he could not operate and control fully 100% the Carousel Club or any other strip club, or probably any other strip club owners in, let's say, New Orleans, where also Oswald was from, or in Dallas, where Os we, Os obviously Oswald ended up and lived as well, um, that you that an individual would have to pay protection or pay profits or something to the mob, just like in, in other big cities that controlled these ventures at the time, like the casinos in Las Vegas. So, Jack Ruby, as we know, let's sort of cut to the chase. Jack Ruby shows up. Jack Ruby shows up in the very room that Lee Harvey Oswald was being escorted out of the jail and everyone else in that room, of course, was two days after the assassination. Everyone in that room was either a reporter or police. Jack Ruby is allowed in. He's got a gun, as we know. He screams, Oswald, and he shoots him and he kills him. And of course, Jack is taken into custody. Now, the police knew Jack Ruby. They were very familiar with him for a variety of reasons. One thing was a lot of the cops used to party with the girls at his strip club and other strip clubs. In fact, I did see interviews with a strip club owner, not the owner of the cannot, obviously not affiliated directly with Jack Ruby, but another strip club owner saying that a lot of the Secret Service, the night before the motorcade, the night before JFK was killed, that a lot of the Secret Service were partying at this particular strip club and the owner of the strip club was given orders supposedly to tell the girls keep the guys as long as possible give them everything they want give them more than everything they want and get them loaded they wanted these guys to go to work apparently the next day protecting the president on two three hours sleep hung over after a night of wild sex and, and drinking uh, and partying with these strip uh, so Jack Ruby was familiar to the police and likewise. So, of course, it was very shocking that Ruby had done this. Now, let's look at Ruby's, you know, Ruby said a variety of things afterwards. He said anything from he couldn't remember why he killed Oswald to, this is the best one, this is the one I love the most, that saintly Jack Ruby did not want to see poor Jackie Kennedy have to testify at a trial should Lee Harvey Oswald go to trial and talk about what happened on those on that horrible day. Well, if you believe that Jack Ruby was that compassionate and that's he had to spend the rest of his life in prison because of that, and I got a bridge to sell you somewhere, I'll tell you. That one is the, the and, and people actually believe that. My parents used to tell me that. I mean, they clearly didn't do any research, but it was really astounding that people, you know, would buy into that before, well, before the mid-70s when the House, like I said, when the House Assassinations Committee finally concluded that it was a probably, the assassination was probably the work of a conspiracy, not a lone gunman. I mean, I'm saying probably, hello? Anyway, so... Jack Ruby never really had a very clear explanation for why he did it, and he really clammed up, other than to say, and by the way, while I don't believe the premise in the Oliver Stone movie, JFK, mainly because I don't believe, uh, uh, mainly because I don't believe uh, Jim Garrison, because if you've done the research I've done, it says that Garrison, as the DA of New Orleans was crooked as the you know day was long that he also was under the control of Carlos Marcello and the reason he went to trial in 1969 and that he said that you know, these other individuals killed Jack Kennedy as the behest of the CIA and the government is because number one he wanted publicity for himself and number two that he was a distraction to deflect away from Marcello and the mob but anyway 
that notwithstanding, the movie JFK points out a lot of really good things. And one thing is, it shows, it depicts a scene in which Jack Ruby, played by uh, Brian Doyle Murray, Bill Murray's brother, um, Jack Ruby says to Earl Warren, head of the Warren Commission, or, you know, you've got to get me to Washington, D.C. If you get me to Washington, D.C., I can talk freely. And, of course, we're Warren, and nobody ever allowed this to happen. Even Gerald Ford, former president, was asked about this, and he just blew it off. Oh, Ruby was nuts, and we weren't going to let him go to D.C. No real explanation. Now, the reason that supposedly that, uh, that Ruby chose Washington, D.C., and this makes perfect sense, is that Washington, D.C. is known as a, quote, open city, uh, a city in which the mafia does not operate and could not operate freely. Actually, Las Vegas was known as an open city as well, meaning they didn't want any murders or gangland activity, gangland meaning mob activity, other than, you know, thefts and burglary and stuff like that, low-level stuff, because they didn't want to you know, keep tourists away. But D.C. was really the open city of all open cities where they did not operate with impunity. So Ruby supposedly felt safe that if he were allowed to go there, that he would, number one, be protected, and he'd be able to speak about what he knew. But that was not allowed. Now, there, it's, you know, it's, it's, he didn't say much. On his deathbed, supposedly, he said things. Uh, he had cancer. Supposedly he got cancer very quickly. Ruby claimed that he was injected with cancer. Did Ruby suffer from some kind of paranoia or mental illness besides everything else? I believe it's possible. However, this is what I believe in the research that I've done. That Jack Ruby did in fact operate the carousel club at the behest of mob boss Carlos Marcello. Marcello operated controlled all the prostitution, drugs, uh, bookmaking in, as the mob did, in Louisiana, New Orleans specifically, and in Texas, secondarily. So Ruby was allowed to operate the club and get a salary and, you know, mess around with the girls, some of them, and so on and so forth. But the real owner where the profits really went, according to my research, was Carlos Marcello. And the theory, that, and what I've read, and the research I concluded, and this makes perfect sense to me, but it's just my theory, is that Marcello was skimming off the top. Skimming off the top, meaning that he was taking some of the profits that Marcello, that were supposed to go to Carlos Marcello, his boss, the boss, the mob boss. And then Marcello found out about it. Marcello took Jack Ruby out to a place in the middle of the Everglades, called Churchill Farms. Marcello had a hundreds and hundreds of acres in the Everglades and in the he owned a hotel, various hotels, but in the middle of hundreds of acres he had a little shack and that's what he called his office because he knew it was very unlikely the FBI could come and plant listening devices, bugs, or get to him there. He felt very safe and isolated. And at the shack, the office at Churchill Farms, uh, in the Everglades, supposedly Marcello said to Ruby, you're skimming off the top, I know what you did, you know what happens to thieves, and this is what your assignment is. If you want to live, if you want your sister to live, if you want your family to live, and Ruby was very close to his sister, and supposedly she was threatened, if you want them to live, you're going to take care of the patsy that we chose for this operation, Oswald, and should it look like because they wanted him to die before he ever had a chance to speak out or, God forbid, go to trial. But if it looks like Rube, if it looks like Oswald is alive in the first couple days after the assassination, your job is to terminate him, to take him out. And that's exactly what Ruby did. And I believe that the reason he remained silent, he wouldn't have if he were taken to, uh, to D.C., but the reason I believe that Ruby remained silent is because his family was threatened, and particularly his sister. He knew there wasn't much he could do about his life. He was in over his head, but he didn't. He wanted to protect his sister and his family. I could go into Oswald. <laughs> Oswald, Oswald, the guy who renounces his United States citizenship, says he's going to be a spy for Russia, goes to Russia, an avowed Marxist, says he's going to spill secrets about the Marines, which he thinks he learned, like he was stationed at a radar base on Atsugi, Japan, 
he goes to the Russian, he takes a Russian wife, somehow greenlit to come back to the United States. Why was a traitor allowed to come back to the United States? Why? Then he goes on television in Dallas as part of a debate saying he's an avowed Marxist and, uh, and uh, pro-Castro. I mean, why was this guy not tailed, bugged, surveilled, everything else, or arrested? Or shot, which has happened. What happens to traitors? No, Oswald's just running free over around in uh, Dallas when he comes back. Anyway, but that's another story because Oswald had an uncle named Charles Moret. Charles Moret was known in mob circles as Dutch Moret, and Dutch Moret was an associate of who? Who you guessed it, Carlos Marcelo. Oswald's mother, Marguerite Oswald, also had a shady past and a shady life. Shady. In fact, that Marguerite Oswald was also associated with Carlos Marcello. So this is how they found Oswald. And they already had Ruby. Marcello already had Ruby from the Carousel Club. Ruby was skimming off the top. So Ruby was given the assignment to kill Oswald, which he successfully did. And it is said that after Oswald was dead, that Ruby, once it was known that Oswald was dead, it's after being in the hospital, that Ruby literally took a sigh of relief that Ruby's job would be completed and he knew his family would be protected and to the best of my knowledge they were after that. So my theory of why Jack Rubenstein aka Jack Ruby killed Lee Harvey Oswald a little piece of the Kennedy assassination. Wow long video um, but anyway that's what it is and uh, that's what I think and folks if you enjoy the channel please subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. If you do Please click the little bell icon next to the subscription button when I post, and please uh, give the channel likes. I'd really appreciate it. You can tell I'm really passionate about these subjects, even when I don't have a home to show you or a location. All right, guys, we'll see you at the next location. Ron out. Bye-bye.